Okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture on BC310 Church Ministry Administration. We are now talking about um, finances, uh, accounting and budgeting, uh, just to give us an overview. Uh, so this is not an in-depth course on financial management, but just an overview of these are the things to be uh, mindful of when you are managing the finances of the church or the Christian organization. Now, um, okay, let's let's go back to the notes. <clears throat> So we looked at you know, some of the key biblical principles that, that motivate our way of managing finances, generating and managing finances. Um, now let's just, just get into some of the practical things, right? Um, I would definitely encourage all of us to make use of an accounting software. Uh, within India, uh, we have uh, Tally. It's a very commonly used accounting software. Uh, there would be others in different countries uh, that help you stay compliant to the local regulations uh, for reporting and so on. Dalavi helps us here in India. Uh, there are some other free open source accounting software packages as well. Uh, I just mentioned two. There'd be definitely others that you could use. Um, uh, and sometimes some banks offer some form of accounting within the banking software itself for their customers. So that is also something you can look at, or whatever works, you know, but use, definitely use uh, a, a system, a software system, because, uh, you know, if, if that's, that's very important. Um, some general things to keep in mind is uh, that in most accounting systems today, uh, I, I should say almost all, almost all, they use uh, what is known as a double entry bookkeep bookkeeping method or double entry system. So every transaction, uh, transactions, um, the, the, it's either a debit or a credit. So on, you know, so it's a double entry. So every transaction appears either as a debit or a credit. And then uh, the advantage here, of course, and this is all from an accounting perspective. You don't have to worry, just that you need to know what's happening. Uh, this all of this would be done by your accountant. Uh, it, it standardizes everything and it makes it easy to make accurate financial statements and detect errors because it's a double entry. At the end of in the end of the day, everything must you know, the the debits and the credits must equal. So then you know, yeah, we've we've tracked everything. So that's a quick check. It's almost like a automatic check to the whole accounting process. The terms general ledger is uh, is part of this uh, double entry bookkeeping method. And they that's kind of what is referred to, it's in the general ledger meaning, and, and it could be a software system. Um, it's where all the data is stored. Uh, so we refer to that as the general ledger. And within that are subheadings, you know, where our money is allocated or where they are, or you, you can call it expense accounts or project-based accounts or so on, from where money is taken. So this is referred to as a sub-ledger within that main general ledger. Now, very important is, and these are some things to think about. You know, you, you may not necessarily, you know, have everything in place to begin with, but I'm, I'm just giving an idea as you go forward, is that you have designated fund accounts. So these are general ledger head, head, headers, right? Fund accounts. So uh, at a high level, at a high level, uh, and, uh, you know, we have, you know, our general fund account. That means all tithes and offerings go here. So when people give tithes and offerings, they go into a general fund account. But then we also have designated fund accounts. That means we try to the best we can track 
coming funds coming in by church location. So there are five locations here in Bangalore. There's a sixth one in Mangalore. We all work. It's all one accounting. So six locations. You know what money came in in each location. We track. Also, there are times people give to specific ministries within the church. So we have certain categories that is fund accounts called example APC books, APC India missions, um, uh, uh, generosity fund which is to help people in need. Uh, we have uh, APC media, we have uh, Bible college, we have outreach churches that is to support the church plans. Then uh, recently we introduced uh, the church planting accelerator program as one of the designated accounts uh, that we have. So these are publicly visible. That means uh, when people want to give, and then of course there's a building fund account for building construction, land purchase, all that. So there are about these 10 designated heads, including this general fund. So general fund plus nine others. So when people want to give money, they can either, if they don't say anything, that money goes into the general fund account, but they can also give designate. They can say, I want to give this money to India missions. I want to give this money to books, the work that we do through publications. I want to give this to media. I want to give this to church planting, whatever, you know, they can designate it. So that's designated giving. So then when money is given to that, of course, it all goes to one bank account. Or we have, sorry, we have three different bank accounts. But anyway, it's all just three bank accounts. But in our accounting system, it will be posted against a specific head, a ledger head. So we know how much money has been designated for that particular area of work. And so money goes out of that for expenses and so on. And then, of course, from the general fund, we allocate, so we budget, we allocate funds to these. And then there are a lot of internal headings, like, you know, we have a in the course of any year, we'll have several conferences. So men's conference, women's conference, youth, this, youth, uh, different conferences. Uh, we will have different uh, um, uh, events happening. So there are several internal ledger heads that are not exposed to people. People don't know they exist, but they exist inside the system. And funds are account, uh, uh, allocated from our general fund to those things. So we know. That's the money we're going to spend. Uh, that's you know that's the budget. Whatever expenses is reported against that header. So at the end of the year, I can you know, or at any time we can say, hey, how much money did we spend on conferences, or how much money did we spend on the men's conference? We can go down to that level, right? So there's or how much money did we spend on rentals? How much money did we spend on, you know, APC, APC Central running the service? So we can pull out that information anytime because everything has been posted against a particular ledger head. Right? And that's important for you to do it because then you know, okay, you know, where is the money going very specifically? Where do I need to change? You know, so for example, if the media team from Central comes and says, hey, we like to do this, then I tell them, hey, uh, no because we're already spending so much money on all these things that we're doing. So if you want to do it, we've got to cut somewhere else. It's not that we don't have the money. There's plenty of money, but we don't want to waste it in that particular area. You know, we have to keep everything tight. When you keep every area tight, then overall everything is tight. There is no wastage of money. Right? So when you know what's happening at that level, at the micro level, that means very specific to each fund or each ledger, then uh, you can make those decisions and uh, overall everything is safeguarded, right? So that's just a, at a high level, but this to this level, if you as a leader know how money is managed and, you know, uh, being used, then you could, you know, it's very important. You will be able to uh, uh, make decisions and take good care of the money. Now, of course, the actual work is being done by professional accountants or people who know how to do all that work. And so you need a finance department. Now, um, 
when we began, when we started, when APC started, we didn't have an internal accountant. We didn't have, th those days we were very small. So we just had an external accountant who would come. So we started with this, right? Uh, we had an external accountant, we had an external auditor. So th they were, they're not part of us, external organization. They would send an accountant who would come, you know, for a few hours in a week. That was all there was. They, the, 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 she would just type everything into the system, check everything, go. So those days, the work was very little. Uh, in the early days, the, I would say the first three, four years, uh, it just took a few hours a week. So we didn't need a full-time accountant. This person would come. We give them all the information. You know, this is the money that came in. It was all handwritten. They would put it. She would put it in the system. Work is done. Monthly reports would be generated, etc., and so on. Then over time, as as things grew, we had our own internal accountant. That means we needed a full time person to handle this. So I think it was only. Um, um, so. We had a part-time internal accountant, I would say, from, uh, I think, from 2011, so almost 10 years later or something. So, uh, oh no, I forget the, <laughs> I forget the year. Let me think now. A part-time internal accountant, I can go back to 2005, I think. Yeah. So somewhere around that, there was. An internal accountant, uh, but she was part time. Uh, so actually, this same person was handling accounts for our from for the IT business that I was running at that time, and she would then give some of her time to church work and handle that. So I think that happened from 2005 or something. Anyway, so we had an internal accountant, and then that was a part time and then later on we had a full time internal accountant because you know as the work grew and there's a lot more to be done uh, they have more staff and all kinds of things so we had a full time internal accountant and external accountant external so this is what we have right now and this is sufficient for us at this point in time so even today we have a full time internal accountant the external accountant still comes once a week uh, will check the work the internal accountant will give you know internal accountant does her work she gives all the details to the external accountant who will also cross check on a weekly basis everything is checked on a weekly basis then on a monthly basis this external accountant generates reports every three months audit happens and then every year audit happens and then there's a another external independent auditor who will verify what this auditor has done. So all the things are checked. Now, at some point in the future, we may have an internal auditor. So that means uh, we audit our, keep things in check internally as well. We Right now, we don't need it because the external accountant is coming every week and checking what, what is being done and by the internal accountant. Uh, and then every quarter, every three months, there's uh, uh, another audit being done. But if things grow uh, to that, you know, that extent, we we don't want anything to slip. Then we will have an internal auditor, and then we will also thinking of see. Right now, this internal accountant handles all the purchasing. Uh, so purchasing request goes to this person. She approves the vendors, makes the payment, etc. But at some point, we may need, when things are much bigger, we may need a purchasing person who handles, who checks the vendors, uh, verifies them, and then approves all the purchasing that is being made. So the point is, this finance department grew over time, but these are the kinds of roles that you will need uh, within your organization. Another important thing to think about is to follow a two-person rule. Uh, at every point, whenever money is handled, there should be at least two people involved. So that, you know, uh, there is that sense of, hey, we can't mishandle things. So if it's one person, you know, 
things could be easily mishandled. But two people, they would hold each other. So example, uh, if money you're receiving offering in the in the in the service, you should have you know two, three, four people counting that money. Right? So that means it's not one person counting. You have more than one person, at least two, preferably three, four, five. So that they are sitting together, they're counting, they're holding, they're watching each other. Right? Then money comes into the office. And then from there on, there should be at least two people checking it. So like we have on a weekly basis, an internal accountant, an external accountant. So everything is being checked on a weekly basis by two people. Two people are involved. So uh, that is happening. Then in our purchasing, our, which I said, you know, there's a, these internal accountants. So for purchase, all typically, you know, big purchase, that means over 5,000 rupees. Um, what we say is that it has to be pre-approved. I mean, they can't spend that money. If it's anything less, small things, you know, people need to buy batteries or whatever, small things, yeah, go ahead. But anything bigger than that, and it's not a large amount, but just as a rule, we have saying it has to be pre-approved. So the person who wants to buy that, you know, it could be any person, any staff who needs to buy whether equipment or whatever they need to buy for their area of work, they get the quote, they send it to the ministry leader. So it may come to me for several things, but it may go to another pastor, say example, Master Jay Kumar, or whoever's in charge of that area of ministry for review. And then once it is approved, uh, the, 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 of course the internal accountant is copied on these emails. Only after that, the purchase will be made and the payment, the purchase will be made and payment given, right? So before a vendor is selected, the vendor has to go through an approval process. So we only allow our people to buy from pre-approved vendors, uh, unless it's you know, so a known, say, online platform or something. But otherwise, if you're engaging a vendor, the vendor has to be pre-approved. We have a pre-approval checklist. Then that person gets the quote for what they want, sends it to the pastor or ministry leader who approves it, checks it, approves it, then it is paid. So there are two checks, the one making the request, the one who is in charge of that ministry area, and then the accountant will dispense the money. Right? So wherever possible, you have this kind of two-person rule. And now everything is done online, so there are no checks to be signed, hardly any checks to be signed, or almost none. You know, all the transactions are happening online. So um, we route it through emails. Everything is documented. Everything is stored. So we have a record of what has happened. A few other things, and uh, we'll take questions. Uh, for everything that you do, there has to be a receipt or uh, a document. Yeah. So when counting happens, everything is documented in our book. When money, cash is deposited into the accounts, there's deposit receipts. Um, there is a, um, a recording of, I mean, of course, the bank transactions. Everything is recorded. Direct deposits are all acknowledged, uh, are, are all recorded. And in some cases, not all cases, in some cases, contributions are acknowledged. Now, the reason I say some cases is one is uh, in India, we are not required to track um, money, track the contributor. Right. So, say example, in the U.S., it's different. You know, everything is tracked by social security number, so you know who gave that money, and they get a, a tax deductible receipt at the end of each year, so that they can use it on their uh, for their tax benefit, tax deductions. In India, we don't do that. There are no tax benefits of giving to a religious organization, and so we don't track who gave how much. We don't do it. But there are certain people who 
request for an acknowledgement. So then the accountant sends an acknowledgement when, when, when she knows that that person has contributed a certain amount uh, and they send us an email, we say, yeah, money has been received. We send them an acknowledgement. The acknowledgement, ser acknowledgement serves no uh, benefit in terms of tax purposes, for, but it's just us acknowledging that that amount has been received. So we have that in place only for certain people who asked for it. But generally, we don't do it. There, there are people who contribute. So many people who contribute. We don't. Even, sometimes we don't even know, you know, who that person is, um, who is contributing. They could be people in Bangalore. They could be around the country. Uh, so it's not. We don't track based on. It's not required for us to do it. In some parts of the world, you may need to do that. So uh, it's different. Um, other other things that you would need to be mindful of is um, vendor verification. So, you know, we have a, before any of our staff can engage with the vendor, we verify them. That means they need to sign a vendor services agreement. We tell them, look, you know, this is our standard of working. We want to make sure there are no kickbacks being paid anywhere, not, none of that in order to get our, our work, especially if it's recurring work. You know, every month we need their work services and so on. Uh, we want to make sure everything is clean. Uh, we want to make sure that they are accountable for tax purposes. So we ask them for their tax documents, etc. So all that happens in the vendor verification. Only then they come on board. Only then we work with them. This is just to make sure, protect ourselves as well as protect our organization. And of course, it's also beneficial to the vendor. Then, as I mentioned, purchase processes. There's a pre-approval process before any purchase beyond 5,000 rupees is made. Uh, there's a disbursement process. We make all payments to our vendors within three working days. So that's something part of our uh, vendor services agreement. That is, we don't need you to wait 30 days. You know, most organizations would say you wait 30 days to get your payment. For us, we say we'll pay you within three working days. And usually it happens within 24 hours. But, you know, we keep it three days in case there's some busyness happening, busy thing happening. But so that means we want to pay our vendors. As soon as they deliver the service, send us their in bill, we pay them. So they, there's no waiting from there. Um, so that's, you know, uh, payment priority. We make sure everybody's paid well. Our payroll is taken care of. That means all our staff are paid on the last day of the month or maximum the first day of the month. So payroll happens on the last day, on the first day. And this is so strict, we never fail to do that. Then our consultants will be paid between first and second, maximum the third of the month. And you know, sometimes there's a holiday in between. But so consultants are paid, you know, because consultants have to report their hours and then you calculate based on the work hours, whatever. So the accountants, you know, you have to pay them before the third of the month. So all staff, the payroll happens last day of the month, latest first day of the new month. And uh, consultants paid before the end of day three, so long as they report their timesheets and everything is clear. Expense claims, that means people who spend money, the staff who spend money, they re are reimbursed for what they spent. And again, we have a process. You have to submit the bills, uh, send it in by email, and then the accountant will pay it back within the same working day, within 24 hours, pay you back. All tax payments are made on behalf of all the staff, consultants. So we are very strict on that as well. Sometimes our vendors want to avoid tax, and we say, no, we cannot do that. Tax is paid for all our staff, consultants, vendors, tax is paid. There are times when we have to pay cash, but anytime we have to pay cash, and these are for you know, like daily wage workers. Suppose we need some things to be moved from place to one place to other, you know, we, we call in a few workers or you know, daily wage workers, then we have to pay them cash. Uh, then we take uh, a receipt from them that they have received the cash. We take their ID card so that copy of the ID card so we know the cash has been given to them, that particular person, get it signed. So, and we keep that as little as possible. So there's no cash expense. Everything is done through online transactions. So 
let me pause you. Are you guys getting bored with this? Okay, you're learning something, or is it getting too boring? Uh, no, Pastor. Okay. No, Pastor, we are learning a lot. Yeah, Elisha, we can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, I was saying we are we aren't bored. We are learning a lot from. No, I can't hear Elisha. Oh, sorry, go ahead. It was my problem with my mic. Go ahead, Elisha. What were we saying? My. But I was saying that we are, we are learning a lot from the practices of APC. We are not bored with the with the okay. lecture at all. Okay. Okay. Thanks. You know, so uh, you know, sometimes uh, people don't think that oh i'm going to hear all this in bible college but you know i feel it's just very important yeah thank you all right let me just in the chat then i'll go back to the notes uh Lysha, is it difficult to teach a congregation to take loans to give in support of the gospel so elijah um, this is my stand we we discourage we tell people do not take loans to give to church. Don't do it. Because, you know, why should somebody else go into debt in order to support God, God's work? Right? So he said, we never even we never even talked about it in church. Uh, we've never talked about it in church, telling people to take loans to give to church. In fact, if anybody came and asked me personally, should I take a loan to give to the church? My first answer, immediate answer is no, don't do that. It's not right. God doesn't need you to go into debt in order to support his work. Don't do it. And um, so I would, that's my position. Um, Kennedy's question. Uh, talk how you have used your credit facilities. Have you ever borrowed money as a church? What would teething problem in started church? If any, how did you manage the situation? Is it an order for church to take to trade in forex to generate extra income? All right. So two two questions there, Kennedy. One is, should we should you know have we borrowed from the church, um, borrowed money for the church? So here's another area where, from the very beginning, we said we will never borrow. It's just our. Per I'm not saying it's wrong. Uh, if if somebody wants to go take a loan from a bank or whatever, that's their decision. But for us at APC, our decision was we will never take a loan. In fact. Uh, in India, the bank will not give a loan to a religious organization. So we can't even take a loan from the bank if we wanted to, because uh, the religious organization doesn't have a steady income, meaning it's dependent on the free will contributions of people. So the bank does not look at it as a source of income. Right? So banks typically will not give loans to religious organizations unless, of course, they can pledge immovable property like other lands and buildings and so on so that's a different scenario but our our position from the very beginning is we will never take a loan from any bank any institution or any individual so we've never done it uh, our, our position is always god you know let the money come in and we will do what god has called us to do and uh, that's been the way and god has always given more than enough um in the very beginning like the first two, three years, be very small. Uh, so the second question Kennedy is asking is about our teething problems when we started the church. Now, our position was a little different because uh, when we started the church, I was also running uh, an IT company. And God worked in such a way that, you know, working from Bangalore for a US company, I was actually earning more in Bangalore than I was working when when I was working in Chicago. You know, God just worked it out that way. So, in the first few years, we had no lack; we had just surplus, simply because the company would tithe into the church, and uh, we had more more than enough more money than we knew what to do with. You know, our congregation was very small, like twenty people. But because the company was giving in to the church, there was a surplus of money. And uh, we got on cable TV, we started printing, we started doing missions, everything, you know, within the first two years, so on. So that was our experience. I know that's not the experience of every person. Uh, but in our case, it just 
God just orchestrated that in that manner. And then the church grew, and then a lot of people also started contributing and so on. Uh, if that was not the case, example, you know, somebody else is starting a church and, you know, maybe the congregation is very small, the income is very small. I would say, you know, just trust God and um, let uh, let God, uh, you know, you journey with God. You know, each one has their own journey with God. Uh, God was gracious in our lives and this is this was our experience. But I also know that for many people, that's not their experience. Uh, but in the early years, it's very tough. It's, that's why we, we want to help churches start. You know, we want to really fund as many churches as we can all over the world so that we can help them start. God was good to us. We need to be good to other people, other churches, to others who are starting churches. So in those early years, for many, it is difficult. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, we just have to trust God and work with what we have. And, and I'm sure God will, you know, bring us to a place of plenty. and. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me take other questions. There is Sri Kumar and then there is Charles. Please go ahead, Sri Kumar. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one question. The first one is um, how we handle the the finances of the the churches, which is outside Bangalore. Like as you said about uh, Bangalore, we have branch, and other part of the country we have branch. So how we um, are they actually depositing the money uh, every week into the APC account, direct account or and how we audit those uh, that finances like um, or is the same is there is it's a common auditor who audits everything and um, uh, and and keeping the records. My second question is um, like. Um, do we ever forecast any project like uh, you know with the money like uh, saying that uh, we are going to buy this land and this will be the co approximate cost and this is something we are looking for so and uh, based on that if the people wants to start contributing the money so is it is it okay or um, is apc practicing like that thing thank you sir mm. good too good two good questions so first one how so we have let's say i think uh, i think 12 churches outside bangalore uh, oh i forget about the forex issue okay i'll come back to that kennedy yeah i'll mention sorry thanks for reminding me oh let me let me answer that then i'll come back to Sri Kumar. so kennedy asked about forex issue so a third third aspect is a third discipline we had as a church is the church will not make any investments other than fixed bank fixed deposits with people's money. So it's also part of our legal trust document. That means the money that comes to the church cannot be used for any kind of private investments. It cannot be done. So I'm answering Kennedy's question whether you know the church can invest money in foreign exchange and so on, things like that. So one is uh, legally we are not permitted to use money that we get in India, outside India. We're not permitted by the government to do that. All money obtained in India must be spent in India uh, because as a religious organization. That's why we are looking to set up an entity in the US and that will take care of our work outside India. Um, so, and second, this, and so the other thing is that money comes to the church cannot be invested in any private investments. I mean, we can't, you know, trade in mutual funds, we can't invest in stocks. It's not allowed, we're not allowed to do that. That's part of our uh, legal setup. We can only buy property in the name of the church, or we can only put it in, it's already in the bank, in the bank, put it as fixed deposit. So you get, between five percent and around five percent interest that's it for a fixed deposit of course if you trade in mutual funds you can get 11 percent 15 percent 17 percent whatever but we, we you're not allowed to do that so that's the rule you know so what happened the reason is this is not uh, money we earn through profit it is donations so it has to be protected it cannot be invested into anything that carries any kind of risk and so only allowed is 
bank fixed deposits or purchase of property for the church. Is that okay, Kennedy? Yeah. So, going back to Sri Kumar's question. Um, so, all of our six church, six churches. That means the five churches in Bangalore and Manglo are all budgeted under, are all covered by APC accounts. What we are doing here, everything I've described to you today, covers all of these six locations. Now, the way we work with our outreach churches is we tell all our outreach pastors to form their own legal entity. That's one thing. So we say, look, you know, we want you to own the work you're doing. We don't, we don't want to own it. Ours is a relationship with them because many of them studied with us or were trained with us. But their ministry is theirs. So we encourage them. We've encouraged many of them to form their own legal entity. Some of them have done it. Some of them have not done it because uh, they had difficulties in their own states or cities to register a Christian organization. So, you know, just the people are creating problems. So they have not been able to register. So then what we do is we say, don't worry. You operate as an extension of APC Bangalore. But we do not, they do not give any, whatever money they get for all our outreach churches, whatever money they get, we say, you don't have to give us anything back. Use it right there. So they don't give any money back, right? So this, this is aside from, you know, these six locations, which I said, where we function as one organization, all the other churches, the 12, I think 11 other churches, some of them have registered independently. They function completely independently. Some of them are continuing under APC as an extension of APC Bangalore, but financially they're completely independent. That means whatever money they get, they spend. Plus, we support all these churches every month. So they get you know, our regular support. So that's how we work. They, they don't give back. We don't ask them to give anything back. Um, because you know it's people who are locally giving and let let it be used to you know serve the people locally there and from there they can grow and so on so we don't ask them now uh, for organizations for the churches that are re independently registered we try to teach them how to do the same thing we are doing you know that means locally you file your taxes and you do your part locally keep your accountants accounts in good condition now many of these are very small churches meaning in terms of finances they're not uh, getting lots of money so they're actually below the the radar of that you know ta income tax and all those things uh, but if in case you know the, the money comes grows they know that they are supposed to you know report and do all those things there so that's the first question and uh, Shikuma, what was your second question? So do we uh, project the finances like? Uh, oh yeah, thank you. Sir. Okay, yeah. So budgeting, yeah, we do budgeting. So uh, and and that's I think the next topic I'm going to talk about is for every ministry area we budget. So what our accountant does is we use historical data. That means uh, how much did we spend in each of those areas the last three years. Take the average, increase it by 10%. So that in the next year, calendar year, that's kind of about the amount we want to spend. If we are doing the same thing, right? Sometimes what happens is we may have had a conference example for 100 people, but now you're doing it for 200 people. So obviously, you know, the budget has to go up. But if you're doing a similar thing, okay, a 10% increase somewhere, that's ballpark. So we tell our ministry leader, you plan that event or you plan that ministry in that amount, okay? But if the event or that ministry is increasing, then of course the numbers will go up, but we do the budgeting and we give that guidance to that particular ministry leader as they prepare for, and as they're working on the budget for their event or their ministry, one. Secondly, for all new ministries, we do an estimation. So for example, we estimated church planting accelerator program. That means we want to plant 
we want to have uh, you know plant churches when help people plant church. I'm talking about India help plant churches India uh, for people who come within to Bangalore to work st work with us for one year you know we need to take care of their expenses and then we send them out we had to support them for three three years so an estimate was about four crores over the next three years so um, that's an estimate right now when we actually start doing things things may change but at least we have an idea same thing for our books uh, this year our budget was okay we will spend 40 lakhs on our 40 lakhs means 4 million rupees on our printing of books which we just restarted from july after we opened up and started restart printing next year our projected budget for printing books is 8 million 80 lakhs so we've given that information to our publication team okay next year you can go ahead and spend 80 lakhs on printing books uh, printing and distribution of books you work with that you know so we project for what we need and so on or same thing with the building project you know so when we said we want to build a bible college uh, we did our research and we said okay we want to spend so much money in buying the land 15 crores we want to spend so much money in building the building or the facilities 15 crores that's our budget and everything is working very well as of now in the purchase of the land which is well under that 15 crores so so the answer to your question is yes we do this we budget for known activities and we budget for upcoming uh, new things that we're going to do uh, sir i just also i also want to know that um, do we forecast this uh, budget and we uh, we inform the people so that they can also contribute this thing and uh, and one oh. thing, if uh, if church, as you are seeing that, like how the ten percent increase is happening in the budgeting, I right? also want to know that um, as a church, when you tithe, as a church, if you are tithing, then um, how that practice, how that thing is also practiced. Thank you. Sir. Okay. So, uh, in in terms of informing the congregation, we only inform them about the big things. Like, uh, you know, I sent an email out in the month of. Uh, I think August, I sent one email uh, saying, uh, these are the new areas of ministry. These are new things we're planning to do. Uh, this is what we are estimating. Like for books, we're going to be resume printing. So this is what we're going to spend this year. This is what we're going to spend next year. For the church planting accelerated program, this is what we want to spend for the next four years. For APC media, so we wanted to start you know, producing short films, so on. We budgeted one crore for five films. Uh, for, and so we said, okay, this is what. So I sent an email out, one email in the month of August, so that if people want to give, they can give towards these new projects. Uh, but no pressure. You know, we're just sharing a vision. We're sharing this, what we've estimated. They are welcome to give. Now, as a church, um, you know, I don't necessarily calculate our tithe uh, month on month uh, to do our giving. Uh, but our giving, because we give in so many ways and forms, which exceeds uh, what we get. So our outflow, which are giving, free giving, our giving is one is we are supporting all our outreach churches. Second, we give to other missions and Christian organizations in India, especially those whom you know I personally know. Because you know we don't want to give money into something that we don't know, uh, so there are certain ministers, especially the mission-oriented ministries, who are doing missions work in India that we support. We give to them. Uh, third, we give through our books and our conferences. That means all these are free. You know, so the uh, huge amount of money goes out in the books and conferences. And fourth, we give to special needs. That means. That is our generosity fund, uh, which supports uh, not only people in Bangalore, but outside Bangalore, uh, especially for those who are Christian ministers who need money for children's education, food, uh, you know, living expenses kind of thing. Those are the main areas, sometimes medical bills, but mostly it's uh, education and living, you know, so the generosity fund money. So, so if you ask me, I think we don't you know say okay here's this money we'll give 
to one in one ministry. No, there's actually more than a tithe that goes out, but it goes out in all of these various categories, um, and it happens throughout the year. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, let me see if I can finish the other questions before time is up. Abraham, uh, we are unable to download the CPAP application form. Oh, okay, yeah, because uh, Abraham, because uh, the last day was thirty uh, first, the our team would have taken it off. Uh, I, I will, I will, uh, I, we will update that page, you know, uh, and open it up for the next year, so we will get that back. Okay, I'll let you know, Elijah. Should finance amount one is able to raise be an indicator for successful ministry or how effective a minister is? Answer is no. Right. So money is not an indicator of how good we are or how successful we are. I think what's important is to be a good steward of whatever God has given to us. You know, and um, uh, yes, uh, we know the biblical principle. Luke 16, Jesus said, you know, if we are faithful in little things, he will set us above more. He'll give interest us with more. So we know that progression is there. But the important thing is we don't evaluate success by money. Money is only one of the many things God gives to us to steward. Right? Just like he gives us time, he gives us people. Um, uh, and, and so... We shouldn't look at money. Sometimes God gives us great influence. He gives us opportunities, favor. Sometimes favor is more powerful than money, you know. So uh, we shouldn't just look at money as an indicator. There are so many other things in which ways in which God works through the Christian ministry. The point we want to emphasize is whatever money God has given to us, let us be good stewards of that. Okay. Uh, Christopher's question is GST applied on church donations is an income tax on churches at 50%. So uh, in India, Christopher, if we do a 12A registration, that means there is, so you register as a religious trust plus you do an additional registration that will exempt all income from tax. So, but that is provided you have the 12A registration, uh, which is normal. You know, we tell all, all our religious, uh, all our churches, uh, so you register first as a religious organization, and then you apply for, you do the 12A registration, and you keep it active. Um, if you keep your 12A registration active, then the government exempts contributions to religious organizations from tax. So you don't pay tax on those contributions. That's in India. Right? Um, Maxin, apart from church collections, do you also practice fundraising activities to boost finance? Uh, the the answer to your question, Max, is we don't do any additional fundraising activities. Uh, we just tell people to give. Uh, I mean, we just you know every Sunday there's one reminder saying you give. Go to our church website. That's where the uh, ministry information is to give. And so people from within our congregation, people from outside, give uh, on their own. We don't force or do anything extra. And uh, uh, you know, when we have conferences, when we have events, we do charge a registration fee. But everything, first of all, is at 50% of the actual cost. So we, we're not actually making any money on it. And plus, for those who cannot afford even the 50% of the actual cost, we subsidize further. So we don't make any money even through our conferences or events. You know, it's always the event is given at a subsidized cost to all our all the people who want to come. So we don't do anything apart from the contributions that come from people on their own. Uh, Charles' question, do you sell APC publications? No. All our APC publications are free. Uh, we don't sell them. Uh, this is one reason, you know, we're not able to put them out on Amazon uh, because Amazon requires you to charge a small amount. Uh, I think they nowadays you. I don't know if they can give it for a zero dollar amount. I'm, I'm not sure, but we, I think in the time past when we checked, uh, you had to charge even one dollar or something. We didn't want to, so we don't sell our APC publications. All are given for free, and so we distribute it through digital platforms where we can di distribute it digital freely. Uh, all the print publications are free, so we don't charge for it. Okay. Okay. 
All right, our time is up, um, but let me finish these uh, last two questions. Charles, how would you advise a member of another church who seeks advice from you when they have been advised by the church pastors to loans, bring a tither, then pray for it, and they get profits? Uh, my uh, my response to that, Charles, is don't do it. Don't do it. I, I don't think it's the heart of God for us to go and take a loan and uh, give it to the church or to the ministry uh, in order to gain profit. You know, so my advice is don't do it. Now, some, if somebody on their own, they want to go take a loan because they have money coming next month and they will clear out the loan and they just want to do this now. I mean, that's their choice. My advice is don't do it. Uh, God doesn't need it. God can handle his money well. But uh, if somebody goes and does it, it's entirely their choice and their responsibility. But I would say don't do it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you for these engaging questions. So um, we will finish um, talking about finances and then do a little bit on the legal side of things next week. Uh, then get into project management and execution, just share some things on project management. And so um, we will, I was looking at the calendar. So we have, so by this, my, my plan is to finish everything by 17th in the next two weeks, 10th and 17th. And then I will, uh, work on an assignment or an assessment that just is a review of everything uh, for you to review everything and get a grade. Uh, you know, well, last week of November, you can work through it. Okay, any questions before we close for the day? Okay, All right. Let's uh, pray and close. I know we've already uh, taken time uh, into our break. Um, somebody could pray and dismiss us, please. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the time that we spent. Lord, we pray that you will continue to help us to put these things in practice, but also to invest more time in them so that we will be able to do them well. So that the stewardship that will be put in and we are able to do it, we shall bring glory to your name. When in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you next week. Bye now.